Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the book of Colossians, and we're coming to the end of it. We have one more lesson after this morning, but this morning we're looking at chapter 4 of Colossians, verses 2 through 6. Paul writes, devote yourselves to prayer keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. We've been in the book of Colossians now for a number of weeks, and you will know that the great subject of the book is the sufficiency of Christ. And Paul carefully developed that in chapters 1 and 2, and then in chapter 3, he applied that to Christian behavior. All of the doctrine has practical implications and applications, and he's made those applications But as Paul was bringing his epistle to a close in chapter 4, he felt the need to advise the Colossians on a few more subjects that were of great significance. At first glance, they don't seem to be related to one another. In fact, in his commentary on Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6, Cambridge professor C.F.D. Mole simply titled the passage, various admonitions. But if there is a common thread that connects verses 2 through 6, it is that of communication. The three subjects are prayer, conduct, and conversation. All three are about communication. Communication with God and communication with people. Communication through words and communication through conduct. Sometimes actions speak louder than words. But words are important. James reminds us in his book of how words can be both healing and harmful. They can set the world on fire, he tells us. So for us to speak well and behave well... As witnesses for Christ, we must first pray well. We must be in close communion with the Lord. And that is where Paul begins with the subject of prayer. He counsels three things in prayer. Faithfulness, watchfulness, and thankfulness. Devote yourselves to prayer, he writes. Which means... Be faithful at prayer, be persistent in prayer. There is an urgency about it. We are in a spiritual war and our prayers and our letters, or rather our prayers are our letters from the front. They are our requests for help in the battle and they should be constant. They must be. The Lord spoke of that in Luke chapter 18, verse 1. He told his disciples that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. Not lose heart because that is what we do when we make our prayers and our requests to the Lord and they're not granted quickly. We wonder if the Lord hears us. We get discouraged and give up. But the Lord said, don't lose heart. Then he illustrated that with a parable about a poor widow who pleaded for help from an unjust judge and got her way only because she wore the man down with her requests. Uh, The lesson is, if a bad judge 
can be moved to help by a nagging widow, then certainly our good and loving Lord will help when his saints call out to him. So we are to do that. And we are to be unrelenting in prayer. It can be difficult, even discouraging, but that is in itself God's way. What we consider delays are all part of his design to test our faith and, and in testing our faith to make it strong by our perseverance. And we will, he will answer our prayer at the right time and in the right way. We trust in him. We rest in him. We live by faith. And prayer is the means that he has given to us to get the blessings that he has promised to us. So, do not lose heart. That was Paul's instruction here. And to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 17, he wrote, pray without ceasing. How do we do that? Without ceasing. Well, obviously, Paul didn't mean never get off your knees. The point is, prayer should characterize our life. We are to be walking with the Lord, communicating with Him. Warren Wearsby wrote that our prayers should be as constant and normal to us as breathing. In fact, prayer is often referred to as spiritual breathing. It characterized the early church. It was a praying church. We see that from the very beginning. In Acts chapter 2, and verse 42, Luke wrote that the Christians were continually devoting themselves to prayer. They were busily engaged in it. And the result was the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Lord builds the church. He nourishes it. He guards it. And so we must look to Him to do all of that, to bless us in participating in that, and we do that in prayer. A praying church will be a triumphant church. It will shake the world. Did that in the first century. William Cooper wrote in one of his hymns, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. He trembles because prayer is the path to strength. It's the path to triumph. Paul said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Satan wants to keep us weak, so he wants to keep us out of prayer. Where we are in that state outside of prayer, weak and unprotected. So we're not only to be faithful in prayer, but we're to be watchful in prayer. That's what Paul says next, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the night the Lord was betrayed, he asked his disciples to keep watch while he prayed. It's the same word that Paul uses here, keeping alert. If the three disciples didn't, of course. The Lord prayed for an hour and came back and found them sleeping. And so he said, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. They didn't. They fell asleep again and were unprepared for the great test that came next when Judas led the soldiers into the garden to arrest Christ, and all the disciples fled, and then Peter, of course, later denied him three times. What might they have done had they realized what they were about to face? Had they known the test they were about to undergo and had taken the Lord's warning seriously and been earnest in prayer? What might have happened? Well, they might have responded differently, might have responded with courage and steadfastness, but, but they didn't. Now, Peter learned the lesson. Years later, he wrote in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. And there's our word that Paul uses here, keeping alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. When we neglect 
prayer. We're not watching. It's those who are persistent in prayer, who are on the alert, who are aware of the danger, understanding God's will and concern for others. That's how we're to engage in prayer. Faith produces prayer. It's when we are spiritually dull. It's when we are spiritually listless and indifferent to our situation and stop praying that we fall into temptation. The devil is uh, always watching and he is alert. Thomas Watson wrote, Satan tempts when he sees us weakest. He breaks over the hedge where it is lowest. Where's the hedge lowest in your life? You may be able to answer that. You may not be able to answer that. You may not know. You may think that uh, it's all pretty high and not realize where it's low. The Spirit of God will show you where it is, where it's low as you study the Scriptures and as you pray. Here's the thing. And this brings us back to the main theme of the book, the person of Christ. As we make Him our focus and know Him, our desires change and we want to know Him better. There's nothing more valuable to our spiritual life than that, looking to Christ. Remember Augustine's motto, love God and do as you like. It's true. It's scriptural. If we love God, we're devoted to Him, we will want to do what He likes. We will love as love is truly to be exercised, and that's always for our good, for the other's good, for the glory of God. But to love God, the triune God, to love the Son of God, we must see Him in Scripture and fellowship with Him in prayer. The more we know Him, the more we know His gifts to us, the blessings that He has given to us, the more thankful, more thankful we are. Thanksgiving is the third feature of prayer that Paul encourages. And this really is the um, fulcrum of prayer. Prayer rests and turns on gratitude. It is motivated by gratitude, by being thankful. So this third feature of prayer brings things full circle. Earlier in chapter 3, Paul commanded the Colossians to be thankful. That's the greatest motivation for obedience. And that is true of prayer as well. The remembrance of former mercies, F.F. Bruce wrote, produces spontaneous praise and worship. It's a powerful incentive for prayer. His former mercies remind us that he is faithful. And when we consider the cross and, and all that the Lord did in order to make us his sons and daughters, we know his commitment to us is settled. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? The point is he will give us all things, all things that we need. And the cross is proof of that, that he is committed to us and that commitment is settled. It cannot be moved it is something we can depend upon. And this is the reason it is important to reflect on Christ, to reflect on the cross and the mercies of God, what He's done for us. That makes us thankful. That makes us confident and responsive to Him. There is a discipline to this. We need to pray. It is essential that we do that, but to do that we need to make a conscious effort at that. The way to begin is by making an effort to remember who He is, 
Reflect upon our Lord. Reflect upon what He's done. Reflect upon the, the, the mercies that the Lord has shown to us. And they are many. We need to pray for ourselves, for our own spiritual health and safety. We also need to pray for others. That's Paul's next directive by implication when he asks for prayer for himself in verse 3. Praying at the same time for us as well that God may open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned. Paul didn't ask them to pray for his release as we might expect him to do. He was in jail, he was in prison. We might have expected him to pray that uh, there would be an acquittal at his trial. He didn't pray for they didn't ask for that. He didn't ask them to pray for his health or anything personal. He asked them to pray that he would have more opportunities where he was to give the gospel, to evangelize. And that was the reason he was in prison to begin with, for preaching the gospel. And yet, he kept at it. Didn't keep him from speaking the truth. He continued to give the gospel in spite of the threat to him, and he did so with success. Still, he wanted more opportunities he saw prison as God's providence where God had put him to do this work. He knew that providence extended to opportunities to give the gospel as well as putting him in that place to begin with. So he asked the saints to pray for an open door which was recognition of God's sovereignty and evangelism. That there is a right opportunity for it. God creates that opportunity, and we must wait on that. Now, His providence is at work in your life as well. His providence had placed Paul in jail, and fortunately, He's not done that for us. But He's placed you somewhere, placed you in the office, or in the classroom, somewhere, where you have contact with people continually. And there are opportunities there, opportunities for God to open a door of witness. Well, seek that. Ask Him to do that. He opens doors of opportunity, and He also opens hearts to respond to the message that we give. And um, this is an example of how Everything is ultimately in God's control and direction. We see that, for example, when Paul preached the good news in Philippi. That's how the church began there. Luke records it in Acts 16, how Paul was preaching to a small group of women by the river, and one was named Lydia, and as she was listening to what Paul was saying, Luke wrote, the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So God opens doors of opportunity, and when the witness is given, He opens hearts to respond to it. God is sovereign in these things. He causes the work we do to bear fruit. So we are to be faithful to Him. We're to be faithful to the message and faithful to wait on Him to open opportunities to give it. Yeah, we are responsible to be active and careful in the work of the ministry. Paul thought so. That's clear from verse 4, where he asked them to pray that he would be clear in his presentation of the gospel, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. The fact that God is sovereign doesn't mean that we are idle. We're to be very active, very responsive and responsible. God is the God of order, and He blesses order. He blesses planning, and He blesses clarity. That is, that is what Paul uh, worked earnestly to give and what he prayed for. He, he spent time thinking about this. 
Uh, he is in a, an unusual situation there in prison and uh, found himself in contact with people perhaps he m normally had not had, had very little contact with. So he wondered uh, to himself, no doubt. He thought about this. How a an old man, a Jew, and a former rabbi is to talk to a young Roman soldier that was chained to him in prison? They had nothing in common. Well, evangelism takes thought of that. And it takes a lot of thought. It's not mechanical. It's not some formula that we simply put out. We approach people differently and need to explain things in a way they understand. One of the most important contributions Martin Luther made to the church and one of the main reasons the Reformation took hold was his translation of the Bible into German. When he was hiding in Wartburg Castle, he translated the New Testament in three months. And it wasn't the first translation of the Bible into German, but his was the first successful translation. The reason was it was readable. He wrote that when translating, we needed to be sensitive to the mother in the home, the children on the street, the common man in the marketplace. We must be guided by their language, the way they speak, and do our translating accordingly. Well, that's how we give the gospel. The, the gospel is unchanging. We can't tinker with the simple message of salvation for sinners through faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And... and God uses His Word to save souls. That is what delivers the seed of life Peter speaks of in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. The Spirit even uses uh, clumsy efforts at giving the gospel. The important thing is the meth message, not the method. Still, we need to be thoughtful in our presentation of God's truth. Think about who we're speaking to. And that's what Paul is praying about here. That, that he would have the right words for the right people. That he would know how to present the gospel to them in the correct way. We have examples of that from our Lord. In, in John chapters 3 and 4, in chapter 3, he speaks to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a learned man, the teacher of Israel as he describes him. He spoke differently to him than he spoke in chapter 4 to the woman of Samaria. He adapted the same message to different people. You need to be careful to be accurate and clear about the truth and sensitive to those to whom we speak. That was Paul's concern. It takes effort. It takes thought. And it takes prayer. He prayed about it and he asked their prayers for him. The power of God is in His Word. And He gives us access to that power through prayer. We need to speak prayerfully and seek the prayers of others for our ministry. And we all have a ministry, every one of us. Again, providence has put you somewhere. It hasn't put me or it hasn't put the person next to you. And you are to look for those opportunities and know that God has put you there for a particular reason. So, we need to be men and women of prayer. Spurgeon knew that when people visited the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, he would take them to the basement where people were fervently praying on their knees. He called it the powerhouse of the church. If the engine room is out of action, he said, then the whole mill will grind to a halt. We cannot expect blessing if we do not ask. That's true. That's how important prayer is. But still, we would all confess, wouldn't we, that we don't pray as we ought. I think that's true for all of us. Prayer, it seems to me, I, and I think I've read this and heard this as well, but certainly from my own 
experience, I must say, prayer is one of the most difficult spiritual exercises that we do. George Whitfield found it difficult. He was uh, a great evangelist with genuine zeal for the Lord, but he used to pray, Lord, help me to begin to begin. Now, that's a good prayer. That's a necessary one. We can't devote ourselves to prayer and pray without ceasing if we don't begin to pray. And to begin to pray, we need to begin to begin. That's how he prayed. That's how we should pray. Now, in verse 5, Paul shifts from conversation to conduct, encouraging the Colossians to behave wisely toward outsiders, which means toward unbelievers. It's a ministry. There are many people who never read a Bible or have heard a sermon, but who observe the conduct of Christians. Our friend Mike Black over here often says, you are the only Bible some people will read. And that means we need to behave well. If we claim, as we do correctly, that the gospel changes lives, in fact, that's what Paul has been preaching and teaching in this letter, the first two chapters, what uh, he does, what Christ has done to us. We have become done for us and, and, and brought about in our lives. We're new creation, new creatures. Well, that being the case, then people ought to see that. If the Bible changes lives, if the gospel really transforms us, and, and if we are being transformed from glory to glory, as, as Paul wrote to the, the, the Corinthians, then certainly people ought to see that in us. So Paul urges that next. Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Conduct yourselves with wisdom. Wisdom is very simply skill in living. It comes with time, but it is learned. It is learned not only from experience, but it's learned from the study of the Word of God. God's revelation gives us perspective. The Word of God gives us goals and direction. And as we follow the Lord's way, we will always do what is right. Now, that, that statement, if we follow the Lord's way or follow the Lord's will, we'll all, we will always do what is right, is almost a truism, isn't it? Um, almost a platitude. I mean, that's obviously true. Uh, at, at least to believers it is. Do what the Lord says, and, and it will be a blessing to us. Do what the Lord says, it will always be the best thing for us. But the problem is in the doing. That's our struggle. So often, we know what to do, but don't do it. it. It it is the personal struggle that Paul wrote of in Romans chapter 7 of of practicing he said the very evil that I do not want. So again, we need to devote ourselves to prayer. To begin to begin. That's our powerhouse. It's the means of grace God has given us to receive his promises. Receive all the blessings that he has for us. We are weak in the flesh. He gives strength. And as we pray and follow his path, his providence leads us to people who observe our behavior for the good. When, however, we are not watchful, people might see something in us that is not for the good. Unfortunately, we get caught in unguarded moments while having a bad day, grumbling about something, maybe with a waitress at a restaurant or in the checkout line where we're recognized as that, that preacher 
or a Christian who, who doesn't live up to what he preaches or what she says. We all have bad days. That's why we need to be in prayer and be alert, keeping alert, as Paul said earlier. You never know who's watching. You may squander an opportunity. And Paul was very concerned about that. We need to be alert to watch for the opportunities that we have. This statement, making the most of the opportunity, is literally redeeming the time. It is a commercial or business term. It means something like buy up. Exhaust the possibilities. Don't waste a minute. Well... That's a high standard. Don't waste a minute. We will do that. We can be assured of that. We know that. Now, that saying that's not an excuse to be lazy, to admit that we're going to waste some time, but then again, we're not better than the Apostle Paul who candidly said in Romans 7, I practice the very, th- the very evil that I do not want. So, this is the ideal, and I think if we looked at Paul's life, even after reading Romans 7, we'd say, he didn't waste much time. There was a man who redeemed the time. There was a man who made sacrifices. And as I say, this is the ideal. This is what we we strive for, and we should strive for, to redeem the time, to, to make the most of our opportunities, to do so earnestly. Man of God, the woman of God does that. We see that throughout the Word of God. They take time seriously. They take life seriously. David did. In Psalm 39, he prayed, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. We all are. Our opportunity to take opportunities is short. Every one of us, David said, is a mere breath. So we need to recognize that time is short for all of us. And we need to pray that the Lord will help us to know how transient, how how brief we all are in this world and and move us to make the most of the time that we have. And then we're to speak well. That's what Paul says next in verse 6. So it's it's back to the subject of speaking. This is uh, how we make the most of our God-given opportunities. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. The salt metaphor is a common one in the New Testament. The Lord used it. Salt is both a preservative and a condiment. Things taste better with salt. And that's the idea here. What the salt or seasoning represents is grace. We are to be gracious in our conversation, not combative. We're not only to to be gracious. Grace is not only to characterize how we speak, but grace is to be the subject of which we speak. We're to talk about God's love and salvation. It's very easy to preach on sin or speak on people's failures. It's, it's easy, I say, because we'll always hit the mark when we get on to the subject of sin. And it, sometimes it's necessary. and Very often it's necessary. I don't mean to say we shouldn't be on that subject. We need to identify the problems that we face. But even then, we need to, uh, I think, avoid what's been called the scolding tone. Don't need to get up and scold people continually for their failures. Uh, Paul says our speech should be with grace. That's the, the salt that seasons our words. Maybe the seasoned with the salt of our tears as we speak to people of the terrible consequences of sin and willful rebellion. 
But always our rebukes and warnings should be wedded to the hope of forgiveness. That's grace. And the Lord is so gracious. The Savior receives sinners as they are. We need to be prepared to tell that to people. That's the instruction that Peter gave in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. That's what Paul was saying here. Speak uh, of our hope and speak of grace and speak with grace. Well, what, what better subject for today is there than this subject of hope? People can talk of hope, the changes they hope that politics will produce or the the gains they hope that the stock market will give or that uh, medical research will bring. But whatever hope this world fulfills in any of those ways or many others, whatever it is, it's only for a moment. We are all, as David said, a mere breath. We're transient. Whatever hopes we receive in this world are just temporal. Now, we have a very different hope, a better hope, an eternal hope. It's the only hope that really counts. That's what we are to be prepared to explain and defend. But we do it with gentleness and reverence, which, again, as I said, is another way of saying what Paul says here, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt. Now, to talk to others about our hope and grace, we need to understand it. We need to understand what our hope is. We need to understand what grace is. That means we need to study God's Word and learn about it. So we need to redeem the time. We need to use the time that we have well and learn. That's really what will shape our conduct. When, when we learn more of the grace of God that saved us, as we were, as, we, um, as, as the condition we were in when we were saved, when we realize all of that and, and all that he did to forgive us and make us into what Paul speaks of so clearly in this book, a new creation, uh, enjoying the mystery that he speaks of, of being in Christ and having Christ in us. As we understand all of that, understand God's grace, we will be grateful and we'll live differently. We should. And when we do that, people will see. They will, they will read our lives like a book and understand that there is something different about us. Maybe as they see that, that will cause them to ask, you're different. Why is that? We need to be ready for that moment and answer truthfully and graciously. And we will do that by God's grace and only His grace. The Lord gave His disciples comforting words in Mark 13, verse 11. When they would be arrested and put on trial, they were not to be anxious, He said, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Now that's the assurance that we have as well. As we walk by the Spirit, we will be led into opportunities to speak what we know. And He will help us. He will enable us. So study so that you will know what you should know. And live a life that's consistent with what you know. That will be good communication in both word and deed. And pray. God help us all to see the need of that, the necessity of being men and women of prayer, communicating with God Almighty. May we devote ourselves to prayer. It's God's gift to us 
a means of grace to lay hold of His promises and receive His power. It's one of the greatest privileges there is. So may God help us to begin to begin to be a people of prayer. Maybe someone is here and all of this is new to you. You've never heard the good news. You've never heard about this grace that we speak of. It's simple. This is the good news. This is the message of the gospel. First of all, you're lost. All people are born lost and guilty, sinners. But God sent His Son to die for the guilty and by His death in our place save all who believe. That's all we must do. All we can do. Believe. Trust in Christ's person and work. Trust in His sacrifice. Lay hold of it and receive it through faith. He forgives all who do. He saves us. He changes us. He makes all things new. May God help you to do that. If you've not put your faith in Him, to trust in Him, and you who have, may God give you, give all of us, a desire to do the things that Paul has set forth here. Be witnesses. Pray diligently for yourselves and for others. And live a life in both word and conduct that brings glory to Him. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the instruction that the Apostle gave to these Colossians and this instruction given millennia ago, and yet it is relevant for us too, as relevant for us as it was to them. He reminds them, reminds us of how we are to live in word and deed, and that we are to be men and women of prayer. Help us to be that. It is a difficult thing for us in the flesh to devote ourselves to the communication we have been given and that has been opened up to us through prayer. We pray that you would convince us of the importance of it and move us to act upon it. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.